Well, I, I thought it would be a great idea if we could get together and ask the most pertinent, important, salient questions in the field of nanofossils, coccolithophores. Uh, there's a huge number of people working on the field, as you can see. Uh, I showed this uh, at the INA in Santos. The number of publications of coccolithophores per year is going up, skyrocketing. And uh, so, uh, because there, there are a lot of questions regarding coccolithophores that have been an unanswered. And there are lots of facets to coccolithophore studies from, you know, biology, geology, I'll, I'll mention them soon. And uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm the one to, uh, you know, pr absolutely know which the questions, which the, these important questions are. It should be a community effort. Um, and I think, uh, I think it would be a great idea, maybe we could put that up on the INA uh, webpage, uh, so that we could, uh, you know, better focus our, our work. Uh, I think every, everything is important, but I always feel, I always feel uh, asking the important questions help, helps me um, uh, focus better and perhaps will help uh, others in, in the field. Now that's the nice thing about coccolithophores, you know, there's so much to it, to studying them. And of course, they've been my favorite organisms. When I started in the 80s, oh my God, 70s, sorry. In the 70s, you know, there weren't very many workers in the field and now it's, it's just blossomed, which is, is great to, uh, to see. And uh, you know, the driving questions, I just put up here uh, all the different fields and they all interrelate with each other. There's no lin linearity. Uh, between one and the other, so um, they all they all interact. So we have biogeography, biochemistry, biogeochemistry, biostratigraphy, quantum biology, a brand new field, which is really interesting. And I suggest you look that up in in Google if you can. There's some fantastic things I can't get into. Uh, molecular biology, sedimentology, satellite biology. There's so much that my human brain can't uh, can't fathom it. So Eventually, we should be getting into uh, the modeling aspect and trying to understand it that way, perhaps. Um, and so, for you who have uh, questions that I, I haven't put up, I'm, I, you know, I couldn't put everything up, I put it in the uh, chat or send it to Felipe or INA, I think it would be, or me, and we could put it together in the INA webpage, Jeremy permitting. Um, so, you know, we could ask, we can put put it in different questions. It's always hard to make a diagram uh, to interrelate everything and put it in a succinct way. That's the trouble, which is, which thing, as you, when you write, you don't know which comes ahead of the other. You know, the order is important. Unfortunately, we have uh, only 3D minds when, you know, this is actually 4D uh, dimensions. But here are some of the questions. One of the most important, I think, is what, the, what would the world be like without coccolithophores? I say this because uh, I have talked to many people at, uh, at NASA and other and modelers and other people who've really never heard of coccolithophores and you know we have to spread the gospel. If you talk to the average person, also I digress a little bit, if you talk to the average person on the street and you ask them what is a coccolithophore, you know, they say what are you talking about? And then I give them my 10 minute talk. And I have another uh, person who knows about these important organisms. I think we could do much a much better job at uh, 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 telling other people around the world, politicians, whatever, up the funding if people knew how really important they are. But some of the some of the uh, people I've talked to and some of the proposals I've written say they've answered the reviewers here as references. What other organisms would take up the slack? Would it make a real difference? Uh, we don't think so. A proposal declined. And so our community needs to really think about, um, think about how to answer these people. I know we always have the same paragraph, uh, you know, coccolithophores are important in the biogeochemical cycle and so forth and so on. But uh, I think we've got to do better than that. And it would be great to become more succinct and focused. Uh, so then the, the, the next question I put up here is what makes them so successful? 
Is it because uh, they produce coccoliths? The coccolith factory, I mean, they spend a huge amount of effort, and we saw from Jeremy's talk, uh, producing these things, and uh, we really still don't know what's, what is going on there. Uh, it would be great to understand that, uh, and it's been going on for a long time, so they, they must have a very good reason, but they don't talk to us in our language, so we have to figure it out. And then there are other questions, uh, you know, what percentage of the oxygen, of oxygen we breathe comes from them. I really have never understood, I don't really have, you know, I don't know what percentage it is. I mean, Balch and many others, and I've read this in textbooks, 50% of the world's ocean. But those include the three major marine phytoplankton, so what is the, the actual role of coccolithophores? Uh, what percentage of the carbon pool do they represent? Well. 1 to 20 is a large spread, is that true, of, of the phytoplankton carbon pool? I have some references here. Um, and I say this is not, uh, not uh, 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 these questions are not exclusive. There are many, many more that could go in here and could be organized in a much better way. I'm not very good at organizing things. What percentage of the ocean sediment? Well, not many people have worked on this uh, recently. Uh, Brooker and Clark, uh, oh, I spelled Brooker wrong. 30 to 90% uh, of the carbonates in sediments. Uh, what is their role in the biogeochemical cycle? Okay, that's a big one. I just put in one little thing here. Contribute up to about half a, 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 what's a, a petagram of calcium carbonate. Uh, one of my pet things since I've started is do coccolithophores and diatoms communicate with each other? So I think that's, I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't look at uh, coccolithophores only by themselves. We need to integrate the entire community in the oceans and, and try to understand it. Yeah, I mean, coccolithophores, uh, I'll go into this uh, soon. Okay, so uh, what is the role of the deep photic layer, which has been consuming me lately? Um, and uh, then we have, where are you here? Actually, who eats them? Uh, it's been said, copepods, how, what is their, really, uh, their real role in the food chain? Maybe I haven't done a, a wide enough literature uh, survey, but uh, I don't think we really understand everything that's going on there. Uh, sinking rates are important. I, you know, I just uh, read a nice paper by Sarah Milner, uh, the affected, how they're affected by uh, temperature. I think it's 2014, not 2004. Uh, so, uh, do they increase or decrease calcification in a more acidic environment? Well, there's going to be winners and losers. Do we really know what's going on? Ah, oh, there's so much work to be done. Uh, how exactly are the holococoliths produced? I, I, there are many questions that have come up during these talks I just put into, uh, and the reliability of biohorizons. Uh, I would love to get together and organize these questions. And by the way, asking the questions help you, helps you think through the processes involved. One of the things I, I've always been, you know, what are, why are, uh, why have Brarodosphera and Miliani, uh, Miliana been so successful? And so I'm thinking they have, uh, this is not the only thing that makes them successful, but this is just one of the ideas I've had. Well, they both have uh, naked hyploid, haploid phases, and they're both mixotrophic. Uh, so Kaminaya et al. in 2018 showed that they are, uh, pomocystosis, they can eat uh, organic matter and uh, Emiliania, there's a, a paper that came out this year showing that they do the same. So are all coccolithophores mixotrophic? Are they or the, all, the, only the ones in the deep photic layer, which really have to be in order to survive down there? So these are really fun questions to ask, I think. I'm trying to figure out what the time is here. Uh, okay. Uh, how are coccolithophores responding to global warming? Uh, I, uh, I put this, to, this chart together in, uh, a couple of years ago showing that they are moving because we have uh, 30 years of satellite data right now. Unfortunately, not the same sensors all the time. There was a color zone, color scanner, CWIFS, MODIS. Putting them all together has been 
uh, a big chore. And so in these, in these diagrams, you can see, see, uh, clearly see that they're moving northwards and southwards. And uh, I read the paper this morning uh, in the New York Times, actually, a science article just came out showing that the Arctic uh, regime has shifted entirely. They did uh, 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 new primary production, NPP. Uh, they have a really nice algorithm. It showed that uh, the entire NPP uh, change is changing in, an Arctic, in the Arctic uh, region. Soon they'll find out the same will be in the Antarctic, around the Antarctic. Uh, the Arctic uh, is, is really a, a fascinating thing. I have a student, Haiping Jess Zhao, who just produced this at 4.6 kilometer resolution. It's just amazing. And uh, what's happening now, which was and is happening more and more, is that the coccolithophores, uh, uh, and we look at PIC as a, a proxy for the calcifiers, uh, are uh, producing double blooms. Uh, so in May and August, before it was only a single bloom, which you can read in all the books, but uh, now they, they're starting to produce double blooms, and that uh, goes very well with the new science uh, article. So uh, things, things are going on right before our, our eyes, and uh, so we as a community uh, you know, could be spearheading a lot of what's going on. Uh, so this is continuing. We're doing this for every uh, year when this, uh, the satellite was up. And we're going to try to relate this to uh, changes in the wind direction, uh, sea surface temperatures, and other important variables. So this will be a fun project. Uh, so the role in the biogeochemical cycle is uh, probably one of the most difficult ones. Because if you try to put this together, I showed this at the INA meeting in Santos, there's a lot of things that go on here. And uh, so you really need uh, modeling. Of course, you can say that uh, uh, you know, it reduces uh, DIC, uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, by one and total alkalinity by two. We know it drives down alkalinity. Uh, so, uh, and uh, not really a, a good thing in the short term. Uh, and, you know, this is psi here. This psi here is the amount of CO2 produced versus calcium carbonate and a ratio, and it seems to be. Uh, 0 0.66. This number is quite important to understand the uh, the pick pock ratio and all the other variables. So we really need to get a, a very good handle of this uh, in uh, in the models and to be able to reconstruct it. And so there's also the ballasting and uh, all kinds of other things that are happening. Uh, one thing uh, would be great to have a better handle on the haploid. Uh, uh, Heterococcolithophore uh, heter life cycles and understanding how the uh, how they uh, affect the uh, biogeochemical cycles. I, there are at least a hundred questions just from this, and of course uh, mixotropy, which is really important because if they're mixotropic, of course the biogeochemistry is going to change uh, a huge amount. And so once they go down on the ocean floor, uh, we're co completely in a different time range here. So uh, no longer in the uh, you know 10-year time range, we're into the million-year time range here, and so that combining the different uh, uh, time ranges together in modeling is extremely com complicated. But uh, you know uh, we 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 know the classical view of this, but really a uh, very good understanding is still uh, far away, and of course they. They essentially pump bicarbonate alkalinity from the surface to benthic uh, waters. Uh, and then once they're gone, they're, that's good. But uh, right now, uh, it's, you know, producing more CO2 than uh, depositing calcium carbonate is a problem. Now, uh, di diatoms are in there too. And diatoms are doing something completely different. Diatoms probably are better for the, for the short term than uh, coccolithophores because they're producing CO2 in this process. Uh, and again, there's so much work that be, needs to be done, but we need to go out in the field. And there have been really very few uh, oceanographical uh, uh, trips that go through the entire year. We need one, we need one or two ships dedicated for, 
uh, you know, to be out there uh, sampling the water for two years. Any volunteers? Let me know. We'll write a great proposal, all of us, and we'll do it. We'll go on the ship and we'll talk coccolithophores all the time. Well, nearly all the time. Okay. So here's this uh, 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 reticular fenestra sessilis. Yeah, I discovered, uh, no, I discovered, no, I didn't. I saw it in the, in the uh, Red Sea even in 1970s, and you can see these diatoms are always around, uh, uh, the coccolithophores, the coccolithophores are always around the same diatom or nearly similar diatom species. There's something going on here, and therefore I think, you know, they must know what they're doing, and they must communicate with, uh, you know, biochemicals with each other. Uh, how about growing them in culture together and seeing what them happens, and then you know, spray in a little bit of dinoflagellates uh, while you're in there, in it, doing it. So uh, now, one of my pet things is uh, deep uh, photic layers, and so my apologies for those who have already seen this, but uh, you have the chance to look at uh, look at it again. So my thing is, since the beginning, uh, these satellite photos are great, showing you the, the chlorophyll distribution, but it's only from the surface, and you can see that these organisms, well, they say satellites are good to 70 centimeters. Uh, but coccolithophores don't really love it up there, you know, photo inhibition and all that kind of stuff. So they, they actually like to live further down. And these blue areas here are so-called oligotrophic. Uh, but I've been saying uh, all along that uh, coccolithophores are living down to depths of 400 meters in certain places, and uh, even though they, may, they might be uh, uh, much less abundant, the volume of this area, the volume, because it goes down to 400 meters here, in these areas there's uh, photosynthesis down to 10, 20 meters. If you could all the volume, it equals or, uh, or, is, or best the volume of these productive areas, and really uh, we need to look at these much more closely. There's been very few uh, uh, studies made of them. I can't, I don't have really time, but this is a model of these. Well, I'll go through it slowly, quickly for you guys. Uh, here you can see, this is a great model of the primary productivity from the surface. And it's e extremely uh, accurate, but, uh, you know, Titania, who's doing this, really doesn't, hasn't heard much about coccolithophores. She would love to collaborate with any one of you to figure out what's going on deeper in the water column. You can see how beautiful this is. So let's do that. Let's get together with modelers. We have to talk to them. Uh, and modelers are, are uh, still not there in terms of what we know about coccolithophores. How do I stop this? OK. So this is a Pisces model showing you uh, with latitude. You see, this is the what we saw in the satellite photo. They like higher latitudes. But look at this. Here they are. Down here, in the lower photic zone and below the lower photic zone, livingly hap living happily thereafter, and uh, uh, again you can see over here, all of these are living down 150 meters. Here's the usual profile in the uh, deep uh, 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 in the gyres, and down to about 350 meters. These are coccolithophores and other organisms. You can see here that this is the estimated chlorophyll A at the DCM. So this is sort of the inverse of what we see from satellites. You can see especially over here uh, in the North Atlant uh, in the uh, tropical Atlantic. But even here, where the uh, as the uh, the lowest so-called lowest productivity, uh, you can see coccolithophores. Uh, here is a, a uh, diagram from uh, Floresfera profunda. Uh, by Cortez, uh, and uh, you can see this is sort of a two-year uh, diagram, and you can see that they uh, they do live down there and are very important, considering that the skeleton produces much more calcium carbonate uh, than Emiliani Huxley does. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to Luke Borfert's uh, work that he has. He was down there in the uh, central, in the South Pacific, in the oligotrophic. Uh, South Pacific, the most extremely oligotrophic area in the world, and he discovered many uh, 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 deep photic layer coccolithophores. So here's the deep chlorophyll maximum, and 
Below the, in the deep chlorophyll maximum, we don't have that many, uh, we have different coccolithophores than in the deep photic layer. This is called the Shea community over here. And uh, you can see that uh, in the Shea community, you have abundant coccolithophores over there. Unfortunately, we can't, uh, well, Ian Probert and uh, Kyoko and others are trying to grow them. Um, eventually, I think we'll get there. We'll pick up one of these guys and we'll be able to grow them. We'll know more about uh, their genetical peculiarities. Uh, my student, Josue, who's listening now, is going to be working on that too. So, uh, you know, we have to understand. Now, there's, uh, they have to be mixotrophic, really, because uh, there's just not enough food down there. Oligotrophic region, uh, you know, so they take advantage of uh, the little sunlight they get, and they're also uh, above the nutricline where they can get a little uh, uh, nourishment, but certainly not enough. So I think these, we'll, we'll find out that they're all mixotrophic. Of course, Emilia and Ahoxlein might be a little different down there than in the surface. So that's another great uh, study to be made. Um, okay, and down there we see that they have actually enhanced calcification, uh, increased production of pigments, size reduction. I'd love to study them uh, from a, uh, the, our two-year ship cruise. Uh, hey, there's enough money out there for us to really get a really lovely international proposal together to, to do it. Uh, so this is kind of a, uh, the modeling that needs to be done. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that is involved uh, in trying to figure out the biogeochemical cycle. And here I have diatome species together with coccolithophores. The other organisms, the pickpock ratio, oh, there's so much stuff. And also the physical uh, uh, chemical parameters I need to go into here. Uh, we're just at the, uh, scratching the surface, let alone the deep photic zone, uh, to uh, understand uh, what's happening. Um, and uh, this is another uh, model. This is the first one, Ernst Meyer Reimer. He was the first one who thought about these things, and without him, we wouldn't be anywhere. Uh, and all of the, all the models uh, go back to this one person, and you can see all the things that go into these kinds of models. But uh, none of them have coccolithophores as a functional group. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm working with Manf uh, Manfredi at Scripps, uh, Manassi, Manfredi Manassi. I'm trying to convince him to put in coccolithophores, and he said he can do that. So I hope uh, uh, we'll see what's happening. Uh, his, uh, his program is called uh, well, Pisces, and he's got one called uh, uh, Darwin. Darwin, which is a program that, again, tries to coordinate all the different variables, but what's missing here are the observations. And so, well, you can have great models, but uh, we need way more and more observations. Uh, and uh, so there's a really exciting time to be around and to work on uh, coccolithophores. And I hope I've given you uh, motivation to uh, continue your studies and to come up with the big questions, to talk to uh, one another, uh, find out what's, what's going on. It's really hard to keep up with the literature, but uh, I think we can do it. And so. The two suggestions I've come up with is let's write uh, the important salient questions and also we can work on a proposal to go on a large research cruise and do all the, all, the, all of us working on that to uh, get some of the uh, answers and put coccolithophores on the map. So 10.30 exactly and so I uh, thank you and uh, here is uh, Wishing you all the best uh, in these COVID days from uh, Rincon, Puerto Rico.